way to think about this. This is my three-step plan uh, for easing on over or, or diving deeper into a plant-based diet. Plan, practice, persist. Okay, so at first, you know, you may feel really super ambitious. If you're seeing all these recipes here, and like, oh, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna try everything. Like, you know, you, you see a new cookbook, you get all excited, and you're like, oh, I wanna make all of that. And you go and you try to find all these kind of weird ingredients. You know, maybe you find a delicious recipe, and you're gonna impress your family. So you go to the market, you spend 50 extra bucks, you know, you go and you slave away in the kitchen, and you come out with your creation, and you plop it on the table, and it's like a big flop. And you're like, oh, I mean, has anyone ever done that besides me? <laughs> It's so disappointing, right? It's so frustrating. So going in, like diving in like that, maybe, you know, it might not be so easy. So maybe it's better to kind of ease in, try a new recipe, a new ingredient, just kind of one step at a time. And the easiest thing is to start with what you know. You know, like all of us, everyone has grown up eating, eating some sorts of plant-based meals without it being thought of as a plant-based meal, like oatmeal. You know, that's a plant-based meal, or it's pasta primavera, or veggie sushi, or a bean and rice burrito. I mean, they're just certain things that you've kind of grown up eating that are already familiar. So why not kind of, you know, monopolize on those, like find the ones that you really love, and include those, because we want you to love your food. Like, food is everything. You have to enjoy everything. And that's the key to success, is finding stuff that you love, and then branching out a little, and trying something new, and then adding that to the repertoire. But you just find your simple, staple recipes, and then you just practice, practice, practice. So I like to think about this as learning a new language. Basically, you know, you maybe you haven't tried caviar lentils, or did you know there's 40,000 varieties of cultivated rice out there? You know, how many varieties have you tried? You know, there's so many delicious different types. So if you try a new ingredient, like it's like learning a new, a couple words in a new language, right? And you kind of string them together, you try a new recipe that sounded good, and then all of a sudden you're like, before you know it, with all that practice, you are at the market going, oh, I just need to get some cilantro and some, uh, you know, cumin to make that recipe. It's like at the back of your mind, you become fluent in eating plant-based. This is not the future of veganism, although this is all animal-free foods. But with a whole food plant-based diet, it's probably one of the world's healthiest ways to eat, but it doesn't guarantee health if these are the kinds of foods that you're still eating. This is the future of plants. All of the wonderful, compassionate, and curious things we're learning about the power of plants in health, and the problem is that we are now adulterating our food with excessive sugars, oils, salt, and flours, and literally for the first time in 14 years, I'm having people come to me that are, have been vegan, that have the same health issues as meat eaters. This was kind of shocking to me. I just, I never really saw this coming because, well, we also didn't see all these different, like 20 different types of burgers that are very, very similar. They're like, you know, they're advertising how close they are nutritionally and, you know, just they're so close to these meat products, but they're also close to those meat products, which is not a good thing for our health. And my biggest concern, because a lot of you, how many of you are vegan? Well, you don't have to raise your hand, but some of you are vegan for, you know, the animals or the environment, or some are vegan just for the health. There's so many different reasons that people go vegan. But I'm worried that the people that are vegan for the health are gonna start seeing stuff to kind of percolate in the research, because it takes time to do studies, and, and nutrition research is super complicated. And so I'm worried that 10 years from now, we're not gonna see any difference between the vegan and the lacto-ovo-vegetarians and the pescatarians and the meat eaters because they're not gonna have much of a difference. They're gonna be eating nutritionally very similar diets as to all those other diets. And you're not gonna see a differentiation in the science and then there's not gonna be a health benefit to going vegan. So then why aren't the other people gonna go vegan? So that's, that's one of my concerns as a vegan and as a dietitian. And this is kind of similar to what we saw with statins and the research on cardiovascular disease is that statins have kind of like diluted the results for heart disease and it's kind of convoluted the science and it, it kind of makes things look different than they actually are. So ultimately, we want everyone to be eating lots of whole plant foods. And what does that mean? Basically, we want to break it down. We want you to eat vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. That's it. So simple. Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. Now if you think about just those foods, there are infinite ways you can prepare these foods and enjoy them. You could take the same, just, just say like a bean and a rice, and you could do 20 different beans and 40,000 different rice, right? But then you could spice it, you could have Mexican flavors, you could have Jamaican flavors, you can have Thai flavors, all with the spices and herbs. So 
So there are literally infinite ways to enjoy these foods, and these are foods that come directly from nature, just right out of the ground, super healthy. And what's interesting for me is that after doing this, you know, when I was in graduate school, what we're taught and what everyone's taught in medical school, what doctors are taught, what dietitians are taught is everything is based on a deficiency model. You know, we're always so worried about getting enough. And I learned about scurvy and I learned about rickets and I learned about, you know, all of these diseases that we saw in times of scarcity. But I haven't seen any cases of these deficiencies ever, not once. I've never seen a protein deficiency. We just don't see that anymore. It's a completely different environment. It's a completely different world. We are now in a state of chronic overnourishment. And those are the problems I'm seeing with my clients. And so ever since I went plant-based, so it's been 14 years since I graduated from and became an RD, and when I went plant-based, I was going to all these conferences and I was going to talk to doctors, I was going to talk to other dietitians. I'm like, no, we can get enough. We can get enough B12, we can get enough you know, iron, we can get enough protein. It was always about defending the plant-based diet. But from what I've learned, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, less may be more. And actually this may be one of the main reasons why a whole food plant-based diet is so efficacious in reducing risk of and actually reversing these chronic diseases is because of what it is naturally restricted in. Because all of the health span and longevity research, which is what I've been delving in since I've been working with Ray. In fact, I just signed our book contract today. So our next book is, yeah, we're so excited. We're gonna do a cookbook called The Health Span Solution. Look for it January in 2020. And so all of this evidence that is so fascinating, this is what changed my mind a lot, is that they studied all these organisms from yeast and mice and um, uh, uh, all these different tiny little species all the way up to our primate cousins. They looked at, they did some great studies on rhesus macaque monkeys. And all of these, all of these animals, when they gave them less, when they fed them 30 to 40% less quantity, they lived 40 to 50% longer. It was the only way they've ever extended health span and longevity in all of the organisms tested. And the stuff we're seeing with humans seem to be very similar. So it's pretty exciting. And so we have to eat, you know, we don't want to eat less food, and that's a great little hack is eating more plants because you get to eat more volume, you get more satiety, you get all the nutrients you need, but it's overall it, tend, it tends to be less in calories. So this is one way to look at a plant-based diet. So everyone wants, everyone comes to me, I mean, literally I get like, I don't know, five, 10 emails a day, I need a meal plan. What should I eat? I need to know exactly what to eat. Just tell me what to eat. Everyone just wants to know exactly, and they want to count, and everyone's using these chronometer, and these diaries, and these food journals, and everyone's calculating, so worried. And we don't worry so much about that. You kind of, it's kind of fun. We're, I'm gonna be talking about that in a, my next talk on Let the Myth Stop Here, that nutrition is not an emergency. But that said, I wanna give you some kind of structure to think about when you're planning your meals, because we do need to think about it. Um, but this is one example, and again, there's numbers, but they don't have to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. So everyone agrees, you know, the American Institute of Cancer Research, Harvard, School of Public Health, uh, PCRM, the USDA, everyone agrees that half your plate should be fruits and vegetables. And then about a quarter of your plate, or really it's about one to one and a half cups a day should come from legumes. So any kind of bean or lentil, I always say we had our class yesterday, hummus should be a food group, that counts too. Soy foods like tofu and tempeh, those all count as legumes as well. And then we recommend you get, you know, at least two to three servings of leafy green and cruciferous vegetables. We'll talk about the food triangle. I'm not sure if I'm talking about, yeah, I'm talking about that next. Um, but these are like core foods, you know, all the leafy greens, every kind of leafy green that you like, um, bok choy, spinach, kale, collards, broccoli, all the cruciferous vegetables, those are so nutritious and they're so nutritionally dense and they're so calorically very light. So at least two to three servings of those a day, you can get that easily in a big, you know, you know those shrink down, like you can get mountains of greens and they end up being like a little cup on your plate. So those are easy to get, have a big salad, a big soup every day and you're gonna get all that in there. And then, and then um, fruit, of course, well that was half your plate. And then we recommend you get your fats from whole food sources, so nuts, seeds, and avocados. And there's an abundance of literature showing that one to two ounces or 30 to 40 grams a day of nuts and seeds have extraordinary cardiometabolic benefits, uh, even for weight loss, all sorts of things. Lots of great evidence on nuts and seeds. But you only need one to two ounces, which is really like the palm of your hand, not a heaping palm of your hand, but like a little palm of your hand. Um, so that's, you know, you can throw that into a dressing. We're doing our dressings and sauces classes tomorrow. We'll show you how to make a great nut and seed based dressing and sauce. 
makes you, it's an easy, delicious way to get your vegetables in. And then finally, I don't really have, I don't think you need to put whole grains as something necessary because everything in a whole grain you could find elsewhere. But that said, they're delicious. They are culinarily very versatile. So I just say substantiate the rest of your diet with whole grains. So let me talk briefly about the food triangle. So Ray actually introduced this whole concept and it's really interesting because we're trying to get rid of the terminology of carbs, protein, and fat because we think that's incredibly misleading. We call it macro confusion. You know, it's like, did you guys see that study this year of high carbs and low carb diets are increased your mortality? So it's like you have to eat moderate carbs. Like, what does that even mean? You know, what do you even do with that information? So then the low carb people are like, oh, low carb diets will, you know, are good. I mean, everyone kind of manipulated the data to show what they wanted. So we're just, we have a million reasons why we want to get rid of that language and we really want to bring it back to food. So Ray introduces an amazing new way to look at it. We got, he got rid of the plates and pyramids and everything and he went to this food triangle. And what you see is at the top are foods that are nutritionally incredibly dense and calorically very light. You can eat them in, you know, infinite quantities and, and it's all good for you. So that includes the leafy greens, the cruciferous vegetables, stems like celery and asparagus, bulbs like onions and garlic, and then mushrooms. We have a whole, whole thing about mushrooms. And then if you look down the right side of the triangle, which is what we do on the plant-based world, here's where we get our energy from. So we get our energy on a plant-based diet from starches, you know, potatoes and whole grains and legumes and fruits. Those are just a little bit more calorically dense than those ones at the, at the apex of the triangle, as well are the nuts and fat, the nuts and seeds. That's where you're gonna get more calorically dense foods. So if you're eating on this side of the triangle, you're eating a plant-based diet, we want you to keep eating right. Because over here on the left side of the triangle, on the bottom, it's the same top obviously, but the increasing energy density. So you may see people on a paleo diet or the keto diet now is a big thing. They're getting their energy, their main energy from meat and eggs and dairy, sometimes not dairy, sometimes dairy, fish, shellfish. But that's basically, they're eating on the left side of the triangle, so they're restricting this side of the triangle, which is why they may have some of these benefits, right? Because they have cut out this part. That's why people say, oh, I lost weight, I feel great, because they're restricting on the other side of the triangle. So it's just a way to explain all of the different diets out there. And right there, those are um, all of his papers, and we have links for those if you guys are interested, but if you're interested in uh, looking at it. The problem we get into is that Western diet, or like the standard Western diet, is what they, they humorously call, I love this, bottom feeding. So they're not going on either side of the triangle, they're eating one from here and one from here. So if you think about it, you know, steak and potatoes, um, fi fried fish and chips, uh, you know, spaghetti and meatballs. Like it's one from each side. So they're getting calorically dense foods from both sides of the triangle really easy to end up chronically overnourished. And this is where we see the overweight obesity and the chronic diseases come in. So we want people to stay to the right and obviously we think if we compare these two diets together, we still believe that you're gonna see all those benefits, the health span and longevity benefits of restricting the animal products. There's so much evidence about the animal products being you know, health damaging. All right, so let's talk about meal planning. So what does this mean in terms of food? So those are food groups, but now what are we really eating? So we want you to eat, and what our book is going to be is soups, salads, sides, and sweets. So just eat the sides. You know, if you ever go to a steakhouse, it's kind of easy to eat plant-based. You just order all, they have delicious side dishes at a steakhouse, right? Or if you go wherever you go, like you can always find a soup, a salad, a side. That's just kind of what we want you to eat, but there's so many delicious ways to think about that. So if you're going to prioritize, I came up with this thing called the six daily threes. And this is basically, I want you to get three servings a day of these six different groups because I want you to prioritize these foods. So instead of worrying about exactly how much you're getting of everything, make sure every day you're getting some legumes. Make sure every day you're getting some fruits, you're getting some other colored veggies, those leafy greens, the little nuts and seeds, the one to, one to two ounces a day, and then I have exercise on there as well. Servings of exercise. So what are the two biggest concerns you guys hear about eating plant-based? What's one concern that you guys hear when people are like, ooh, I can't go plant-based because it's... Protein. Not a protein. I love my meat. My, I can't give up my meat. Yes, my meat. Not enough diversity. Not enough diversity. It takes too much time. It takes too much time. Dairy and cheese, yeah. And what? 
cheese, I can't give up cheese. Ray always says, if you think you can't get up, that's why you should. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think what I've seen over the years is mostly, you know, it's too hard. Like, I don't know what to make, you know, like, what will I make? And the other one I hear the most too, I hear all of these too, but the two that I want to address specifically are also, it's so expensive. Which I think is so interesting because you can go literally on either side of that. There's a continuum for both sides of the spectrum. So I kind of came up with different many. So on an omnivorous diet, you could go on one side of the spectrum and you can eat fast food burgers and fries on the dollar menu, right? Or at home for really inexpensive, you could whip, whip up some eggs and toast or a tuna sandwich on a budget, right? Or you could go out and you could splurge on a lobster dinner or have Haagen-Dazs and filet mignon, you know, at home. So there's like, there's a whole spectrum of how you could do it on the omnivorous side, and there's a whole spectrum of how you could do it on the plant-based side. So on the plant-based side, you can make a, you can enjoy a bean and rice burrito in an affordable Mexican restaurant, or whip up a really, you know, peasant food, a lentil stew at home, or a PB&J, right? Those are really cost-effective. Or you could splurge, right? You can go out and have truffled ravioli with cashew cream sauce and a portobello mushroom wellington. Or you could, you know, cook up roasted cauliflower flatbread or a lobster mushroom bisque. That's my new thing is these lobster. Have you guys tried lobster mushrooms? So good, they're amazing. They kind of act like lobsters, but they're not lobsters. <laughs> so the point here is that there is such a spectrum. It doesn't have to be either or, it doesn't have to be extreme. I want everyone to feel like they could dive in no matter what the budget, no matter what the um, ability in the kitchen. Like I said, like you don't need to be a trained chef. And I think that's what I want people to know is you know, everyone can learn how to bake a perfect potato. And everyone can learn how to whip up a really good batch of, you know, rice and beans. But you could also get really creative and it could be really fun. But really, we want you to stick to more of the peasant foods for the health perspective. Like, I don't want you to be buying all of those processed meats. And those are the things where it gets expensive anyway. And those are the things that, that have all the extra um, salts and sugars and oils and flours. All right, so. <laughs> I've decided that I think there are two types of kitchen people, and I think this will reveal a lot about your personalities. So there's the Ray type, and there's my type of person. So raise your hand, but listen to both types first. Okay. So in my house, or my, I now I'm living in an apartment for the last couple of years. I used to um, have big cabinets and stuff them all. So I, I love to be prepared for like not the apocalypse, but for a recipe that I really want to make and just have all the ingredients ready to go. So I, okay, some of you are on my team over here. So like, you know, if you go into my, my cabinets, you'll see that I've got my white beans lined up. I've got enough all the way to the back, and then I've got all my different types of hot sauces, and I've got all my different types of marinara sauce like lined up, so God forbid I run out, I've got another bottle ready to go. And then if it's getting close to being done, I've got it on a list ready for the next time I go to the store. Okay, so that's, that's type A, we'll just call it type A conveniently, right? And then there's the Raymonds of the world who like, when I go to his, when I go stay with him in Alabama, because we, we're a bi-coastal couple, I'm in LA and he's in Alabama, when we're in Alabama and his kitchen is like empty and I get a little panicky. I'm like, what are we gonna eat? Like there's nothing in the house, like it's like empty. But he is so creative that he could whip me up an amazing meal based on nothing. But he's just like, why would, yeah, I mean that's a talent, right? That is a talent, I have to give him credit for that. But it's like, I wanna be able to find any, like I'm always looking at recipes just cause you know, I get, I do the Instagram food porn thing where you just kinda like, you know, you gotta get, get, how many of you go down that, yeah, that's kinda fun. You're like, oh, and you wanna make everything and everything sounds delicious, especially if you're hungry. Uh, but then, you know, so he can do that. So how many of you are more like me, the crazy kind of, you gotta have everything, so, okay, my people, cool. And then how many of you are the real creative? Yeah, the truth is, budget I have three of everything. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. You're making me look crazier than I really am, or maybe than I think I am. Um, yeah. Okay, so how do we divide this up? If you want to be a little bit more or on the middle, or however you want, there's three ways to think about shopping and stocking your kitchen. So there's the fresh, the flavors, and the foundationals, because I like I like everything to match, but really staples. So the fresh things are the things you're gonna to have to go to the market for. Even if you're like me, I can't keep everything stocked fresh all the time. I have to go to the market at least once a week for that. So those are your, you know, your leafy greens, your all your fruits and vegetables, all that stuff that just doesn't last very long. Um, and that's so you just have to plan on kind of going to the store once a week for those. And the flavors are basically like the sauces and seasonings. And you want to be well stocked with this stuff, especially because what if all of a sudden you decide you want to make jerk tofu or oh wow you just saw a new curry recipe and you want to make sure you have all those fun ingredients. So that includes stuff like, and you could just buy these as needed. So the, the sauces, the marinara, the salsa, the hot sauce, sriracha. I always think everything should have sriracha on it. 
barbecue sauce, the ketchups. I've got so many different types of mustards now. Then the tamari or the soy sauce, whatever type you like for those. And it's so fun to have a spice cabinet that is just, you know, buzzing with opportunity. Like I look at that and I'm like, oh, like it just makes me want to make all sorts of things. And now they have these really fun blends you can get that are just like awe inspiring you. So just stocking up on that stuff. And when you find a recipe, you know, and you don't have an ingredient, oh no, like my alarm goes off. I just like to keep lists, right? So I know exactly where everything is at every store. So I'll go to, I have a Ralph's next to me I can walk to. Now I'm, we have a new Trader Joe's I can go to, or we'll go to like, like the Whole Foods. So I've got like lists I know exactly, I put it in order of where it is in the store. And I just have a kind of a, see, come on, I'm not alone, right? <laughs> right, we're organized, it's organized. It's a little type A, but it's okay. Uh, and then you wanna have like your olives and your pickles, your fermented foods, jalapenos, I love jalapenos. Um, and then it's nice to have jarred minced ginger and garlic because those happen to come up all the time. Those are just nice to have stocked. And the other thing is like, if you travel a lot, like we do, like we're always traveling, and I like to come home and have a healthy meal. So it's nice to have a lot of frozen stuff and a lot of jarred and canned stuff. So like, I could literally always come home and I'll have frozen, you could, frozen vegetables are amazing and frozen fruits and frozen grains and frozen everything because you could, oh, they stay for at least six months to a year, right? And you always have vegetables and they're just as healthy if not healthier because they're flash frozen. So a lot of people are worried about that, but it's actually a benefit because it goes directly in the freezer from the earth and it may be even nutritionally more full than when you, it goes all the way from the truck all the way to the time you actually eat it on the shelf. And then there's the staples. So these are things that you only need as needed as well, but it's nice to have a nice collection of dried legumes, because I always want you to be able to have your legumes every day, peas, lentils, beans. You could also get refrigerated tofu and tempeh. Those seem to last a little longer um, than some other foods, so you can keep those in the fridge for a while. Dried whole grains, you know, there's so many grains, and I, I ended up having to be gluten-free for a while, so that kind of pushed me to get super creative and like branch out on stuff I would have never tried before. So like I was experimenting with like millet and amaranth, and how many of you have kind of had fun with grains? A little bit, yeah. There, there's a whole world out there, really. It's, and that, like I said, 40,000 varieties of rice, cultivated rice. And it's good to have a collection of raw nuts and seeds. You know, these are so, like I said, so healthy, and there's so many different types. And you can do so many fun things with them. You can make those Parmesan cheeses, like they have upstairs next to the pizza. Have you guys seen those? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna admit to tasting all of those this week so far. Um, but you can make your own with just some nuts and some nooch. How many of you always keep nooch stocked? Nutritional yeast, yeah. foundational. Like if I am on my last can, that's an emergency, go to the store in the middle of the night. Um, and then it's good to have, you know, stuff like canned, canned goods are really good. You know, get them canned in water, like stuff like corn and artichoke hearts and roasted red peppers, those are great in recipes. And then a tomato products, you know, you could do a lot of things with those, like tomatoes that are in a box, like that was the um, palm, and then there's, yeah, and then they have, now they have these great salt-free tomatoes in cans, like there's Muir, Muir Glen, I think it's called. They have a lot of salt-free tomato products, so those are fun to use as well. Dried fruits and, and paste and purees, like I cook with sweet potato puree or pumpkin puree. Those make really good baked goods and they make really good you know, soups and stuff like that as well, applesauce. Um, and then you could also keep uh, shelf-stable plant milks and shelf-stable boxes of veggie broth. If you're, if you're really industrious and you make your own, then good for you because that's a really good idea. Just do you guys, have any of you made your own broth yet? Oh yeah, you guys are like professionals. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Yeah, I mean, it's so great to start collecting all of your peels and vegetables, and, and I'm trying to explore that more. We're gonna have to do that for the book, but it's pretty exciting. And then there's also three ways to shop. There are, depending on what you're doing that week, you know, there's the ambitious, so let's say you're putting on a dinner party. Like I was, we, we were talking last night about having our non-plant-based friends who come over to eat and what's the strategy. And I'd love to hear you guys jump in anytime, but my strategy is I, didn't, I had an animal-free house. Well, I had my dog, but I mean, I think no one's allowed to bring dead animals into my house. And I don't mind if they don't want to bring any food, but they can just come and eat. And so my, my goal was always to make sure everyone left really full and really happy. Like I stuffed everyone. So I had like a whole variety of, lots of different dishes, that stuff that everyone would be happy, someone would be happy with everything, and just a ton of food. And so that was one of my, those were my ambitious times. That was when I had a huge, other, my ex-husband's family was huge, so we'd have these huge parties, um, and that was my ambitious week. So when you're entertaining, those are the ambitious times, so that's when you kind of have to strategize a little bit more. Planning comes into play really, really well there. And then there's convenient, like, you know, how many of you are working and busy, and sometimes you just need the convenience? So nowadays, 
there's so many great convenient foods that don't necessarily translate to unhealthy foods. Like my favorite thing now are, you know, do you guys, any of you go to Costco or Walmart or Sam's and they have those huge bags of shredded cabbage salad mixes. So that saves hours of chopping, washing and shredding and all that jazz. Love those. So those are great to have on hand. We always have bags. Well, I always have bags. He may have one if I'm lucky. <laughs> well, he, he knows when I come, he stocks up for me. Yeah, he just, he doesn't want me to get like, you know, all crazy on it. So, but those are a good convenience food too. Like anytime you get the chopped, pre-chopped veggies um, or fruits, it's just because we spend so much time chopping, right? And either doing frozen, which is even more convenient and more affordable, but now they have stuff that's already pre-chopped. It's like so easy to find like everywhere now, like everywhere we go, even in the middle of the South. <laughs> He's from Alabama, so everywhere, even in Alabama, I'm always making fun of him because I'm from a, I'm a big city girl from LA. But um, there's they have these wonderful convenience foods everywhere now. And the other thing to consider is budget. So that's another reason to go and stock up at places like Costco and Sam's and Walmart because you can get some really great deals on these big batch things that are going to last a while, like cans of of a tomato sauce or big bags of rice or big bags of potatoes. Like at those big Costco has like the most amazing sweet potatoes for like half the year. The, oh, I'm hoping they're still there when I get home. They're like my favorite sweet potatoes in the world. Um, but it's great to go for on a budget is to shop at these stores and really just kind of plan ahead a little bit and you just get a lot more bang for your, your buck. Okay, so then everyone asks, well, what do I need if I'm gonna eat plant-based and what kind of crazy equipment do I need? And like truly you can get away with a knife and maybe a pot and pan, like nothing extraordinary. But there's also here, there's also a big continuum because you could also, it's really fun to be on a ship. This is not my medicine, right? This is like the boat. <laughs> so this combined with the medicine is kind of fun. Um, so, <laughs> I don't need that wine. <laughs> so there's like a whole spectrum of how you know gourmet do you want to get or how fancy do you want to get. Like I said last night, my big divorce present to myself was this Breville Smart Oven. Have you guys heard about this thing? Oh my gosh. Okay, that was my big splurge item. What? Oh, 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 you, I'm sorry. I mean, like this is, I'm sorry and you're welcome. It has an air fryer and a pizza maker and a dehydrator and like guys, I mostly am only cooking for myself now. So it's so easy, I don't have to turn on the whole oven. It's like this little tiny thing the size of a microwave, it's amazing. So that was the most biggest forge I've ever done. Air fryers though, people, have you guys gotten an air fryer yet? Yeah. How fun are the air fryers? What's your favorite thing in the air fryer? Oh, Okwa. Ooh. Cut it, set it, and forget it. Oh my gosh, that's what I do with cauliflower and potatoes. What else, what else? Corn tortillas. Oh, into chips, and just plain. You don't even need to add anything. Do you ever do lime or like cumin or? You can, you don't have to. Ooh, that's a good budget item too, and healthy. What else, what else have you guys made in the air fryer? Brussels sprouts. Yum, and what else? French fries, oh my gosh, they're so good. And my, my favorite thing now, my daughter loves tofu, like she can go through a whole block of tofu every time she comes over. So I always have, I make her in the air fryer now and she loves that because it's like that dense, crispy, like you don't even have to do the whole freezing thing. And yeah, you have to press, it's kind of fun. So the air fryer is one, yeah, what's your, throw it out there. What's a good price for an air fryer that's multi-purpose? So a good price for a multi-purpose, I don't know, but what I would say, this one was, this was my big, biggest budget item I've ever spent on myself. It was like $400. But I think if you get it at Bed Bath & Beyond, you get the 20% off coupon. I, w I always, I love going on um, Amazon and just reading comments and just comparing. It helps you kind of compare items. I heard the Breville Air Fryer is really, really good just by itself, but, I, but that's the only one I know specifically. So anyone else know? What was the name of yours? Uh, mine is the Breville Smart Oven, but that's the one that has the air fryer and the dehydrator and the, just my heaven on a, in a machine. Um, so there's all those different things too. The other thing a lot of people really love, and I think one of the gateway foods to a plant-based diet are green smoothies. And when I first started, that was like my big thing. I was doing videos and shit. everyone has to have a green smoothie because no one wanted to eat their greens. I was always making green smoothies. So that's when I got my Vitamix and those last forever or people love the Blendtec. So you're either a Blendtec person or a Vitamix person, but you don't have to be. Cause then Ray got me really obsessed with my Nutribullet. I use that actually more than anything. And that's so easy because I don't like to wash dishes and it's just the easiest thing to wash. And we make all of our dressings and sauces. We're gonna show that tomorrow in a Nutribullet. But so a blender is good to have for your sauces and dressings and your smoothies if you're doing smoothies. And those you can make soup in as well. The immersion blender is great if you just wanna puree a soup or make a, what did we make yesterday with a, one of our hummus, hummai. One of our hummai we made with the immersion blender. And then a food processor. So 
I have to admit, I have a love-hate relationship with a food processor. You guys, love, who loves a food processor? You love it? Does anyone have a love-hate thing? Like, it's like so much to clean up, and it's a whole to do, and I can never get it to chop right, right? Right? Thank you. But it makes the best hummus consistency, but it's, I'd rather just make it, yeah, simpler. The Breville, yeah. the Breville food processor chops everything, right? I love The Breville food processor. All right. It would, like, pour something off. Uh, see, but they have good products. You get what you pay for sometimes. You know, and sometimes, and when we talk about pots and pans too, you know, I've always been kind of stingy on my pots and pans. I just kind of get the cheaper ones, but like, I really want to get a La, La Crescent, and I really want to invest, and when you use a good one, you know, it'll last forever, so sometimes it's good to invest, maybe get one or two here and there, as your budget a lot. But again, you don't need this stuff. This is all kind of optional. And then, I mean, there's so many like luxury items, but those are kind of real basic staples. Can anyone throw out something else that they think is absolutely necessary in a plant-based kitchen? Spiralizer? Spiralizer's fun. Vitamix. Vitamix. Mandolin slicer. Mandolin slicer. Just be careful of your hands. Wear the glove. <laughs> We've all been there too. What else? Oh, the Instant Pot. I'm finally learning how to use the Instant Pot. AJ introduced it to me like, I don't know, eight years ago? When was it? And like, Finally, it is really good. I realized my first one was gifted to me and it was broken, so that was why it just never worked properly. So I finally bought a really good one and I really love it. So that's a great instrument for like literally the set and forget it thing. You just can make your whole meal in like 30 minutes. Like you can make a soup from scratch and beans from scratch if you don't already know, I think you guys are already. Spices and herbs. Spices and herbs? What, oh, spices, well we talked about spices and herbs. They're in the picture. Well, I think Ray put this in the picture because he wanted to show his cool little sciencey chemistry spices and herbs rack he made out of test tubes. Oh, that's so cool. I think that's what you wanted to point out. He also has speakers and what? What? Speak up. Oh yeah, no, I said that already. I already you missed it. You weren't paying attention. See? <laughs> Did we not talk about spices and herbs and herb blends and yeah. and you can make your own herb blends, which yeah. is really creative. Yeah. But you know. We did. You weren't paying attention. Do you have a recommendation on the immersion blender, though? You know, I have, I think it's a Cuisinart, but I heard someone last night say that Breville's really good, and I guess I'm kind of seeing that Breville has really kind of good products. Um, but they're like also $20, so I would just go and like feel it out, like at Bed Bath Beyond, or just again read the reviews on Amazon. Like, those always seem to steer you in the right direction. But yeah, I like my Cuisinart. It's really simple. 20 bucks. Yeah. Anything else? I'm trying to experiment more with the mandolin and the spiralizer too. And I was really proud of myself because I finally made spaghetti swatch for the first time this year, or actually last month, and like it was so easy. Oh, I didn't even so need anything fancy. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. Yes? Do you make your own sauerkraut? Sauerkraut. Oh, I want to learn. No, I do not. I could eat any. I, does anyone have a recipe group that sauerkraut? Your mom does. Ray does. Yeah, his mom makes killer sauerkraut. And he, she cooks it on Thanksgiving. And it's, is it Thanksgiving or Christmas? Yeah, I'd never had that before. It's really good. My, my friend recommended the, the top from Crowdsource. From Crowdsource. Is that a website, Crowdsource? Yeah, Crowdsource. Crowd, crowdsource, not Crowdsource, but Crowdsource, cute. And it's, it's this special, special little top that you can put on a, a mason jar to make your Ooh. crowd. It works really well, it's expensive. Our friend who's a chef in Thailand is coming to visit us in Nashville when we get back in April because she's going to a whole, whole class on fermented foods. So hopefully she'll give us some lessons <laughs> after she gets back from that. Um, and then the other just must-haves I just want to run over real quick are measuring cups and spoons. If you use them, you don't really have to, by the way. I always, my mentor is Brenda Davis. And one time when I was first got asked to write my first cookbook, it was a complete idiot's guide to gluten-free vegan cooking. And I said, Brenda, will you write this cookbook with me? And she's all, <laughs> I'm allergic to measuring cups and spoons. <laughs> I don't use them. <laughs> I've always remembered. I mean, you can just hear her saying that. She's just, that's why she doesn't. She doesn't. She gets away with being the dietitian that doesn't cook, <laughs> at least publicly. But she's really a great chef. She's amazing. So anyway, so those are good to have if you're gonna follow recipes. And that's the thing, guys. You know, I grew up in this weird home where my mom, like, and it's still like this. If she wants to follow a recipe, it's an all-day event for her. Like, she's. Oh my gosh, I have five people coming for dinner on Friday, so I'm gonna go shopping today, and I'm gonna, and she's like so panicked about making a recipe, and it was like a whole to-do for her. And then when I grew up, I'm like, what is she, what is wrong? It's so easy to follow a recipe. Like, why is it so hard for her? And I realize she's kind of dramatic. But then I realized that I look at recipes like a template, and they don't have to be perfect, but it's a great way to just get ideas, and it's a great way to get started in the kitchen. If you really have no idea what you wanna make or how to make it, 
Think of something you love to eat and Google it. Now I've got Dr. Google out there, so you just Google whatever you want to make, put plant-based in front of it, and then try it out. If it doesn't work out, you learn. Like you will learn, use it as a learning way. And if you love that, this is what I did when I started. When I found a recipe I loved, I put a heart on it and I saved it. And if I didn't like it, I would cross it out or I would just throw it away. And I ultimately built up, you just need what eight to 10 recipes really, really, we all are creatures of habit. We all really only rotate between eight to 10 recipes. And then maybe we, we get sick of one and then we move on to a couple more. But it, we really are creatures of habit. So recipes are amazing ways. And nowadays, oh my gosh, when I got started, there was no, there was no thing as a plant-based. Like it was, it was, there was no internet, you know? I'm dating myself. But now it's like anywhere you go, you can find so many great plant-based recipes and you can make anything. So that's, that's where the measuring cups and spoons would come in. Um, a ladle, some tongs, a whisk, baking sheets, oven mitts. I just wanted to make sure we included everything. Oh, a milk frother, if you guys like a soy latte, you can make them at home for a lot better than, a lot cheaper than a Starbucks. But the truth is, really, you don't need much, and the other side of that is you can have as much and have as much fun as you want. So some simple swaps. The other thing is if you find a recipe that you've always grown up with, like if you're still transitioning, or if you, someone tells you, or some, let's say you love jambalaya growing up. Like, oh, how can I make jambalaya plant-based? So you just take a recipe that you've already been using, and then nowadays it's so easy to swap. So of course you can go swap out with all the mock products, but instead of that, you can use whole products. So um, if you're looking for a meaty texture or umami, we talked about umami, but um, tofu, mushrooms are amazing. Like you can chop up mushrooms really finely and make it like a ground beef kind of a product and that goes really well. That swaps in for like a bolognese sauce or you could use those in a lot of different ways. Then you could use like a big portabella as a burger, you know, like you use, use them for all, diff, all different types of um, mushrooms. We were really experimenting in Thailand with like um, shiitake mushroom stems. You can make great burgers with shiitake stems um, and using the mushrooms as a, I mean, there's so many great ways to use mushrooms. Miso adds that umami flavor. And then of course, tempeh. How many of you love tempeh? Such a great food. It's, so, it's got such a unique texture too. And then seitan, if you're not gluten intolerant or, or a celiac, seitan is a great product that you could use anytime you need, a meat, you need a meaty texture in a uh, recipe. Cheese, now, oh my gosh, there are so many great cheese books. Like Miyoko has that artisan cheese. Have you tried Miyoko's cheeses? Oh, the goddess of vegan cheese. But she also has a great book, so you can learn how to make your own at home. That's pretty exciting. I haven't experimented that much yet. But Miyoko Shinner. Miyoko, M-I-Y-O-K-O. She's like a legend in plant-based cheeses. Oh, you have to try them. But there's so many products out there now. I mean, like literally we're all over, we've been all over the country and we're finding these products everywhere. So it's pretty exciting. But I mean, literally a little bit of nutritional yeast, you got a good cheesy thing going on there. So that's good in sauces as well. Um, if you're looking for egg replacement, you can do, it depends on what you're making, right? Now they have, have you guys tried the Follow Your Heart egg? The vegan egg, it literally, it's like a powder that you add ice water to and it's like, it acts, smells and tastes and acts like cheese, like eggs. Like you can make frittatas and crepes and everything you used to make. Um, but you could also do it with a chia seed. You can make a chia egg or flax egg with one part seed to three parts water and it will gelatinize. You could use that in baking. You could use it in sauces as well. Um, you could use, if you're baking, banana, mashed banana, mashed applesauce, all those products um, replace eggs and baked goods as well. And then the milk thing is the easiest thing to replace ever in any recipe now because there's, every, there's a wall of plant milks everywhere you go. You know, you get every type of milk possible. Please. Oh, nutritional yeast fortified or unfortified. It's hard to find unfortified. It's really hard to find unfortified. I just want it to not have folic acid in it and it's really hard to find. They have a couple brands. They're more expensive and they're harder to find. Um, but if you can, it's better to have without folic acid. Amazon. Amazon. Sorry. Which Sorry. one? S A R I. S A R I. Okay, thank you. I haven't seen that one. And Dr. Furman. And Dr. Furman's. His is really expensive, though. And Walmart sells an organic raw. Walmart sells an organic raw. Online. Online. And no, no folic acid? No. Nice. Nice. That's good. So that's good. If you can find that, that's definitely opt optimal. Yes. Fava beans. Aquafaba. Thank you. Yes, aquafaba is kind of an exciting, not new ingredient, but new discovery of how to use it. It's basically the liquid in the garbanzo bean can 
people are using it. They're making these incredible foams that are like stiff foams. Like they're making meringues out of it and all sorts of like they're baking with it. So that, thank you for bringing that up. I'll go, I gotta add that to the list. Um, why do you say not have folic acid in nutritional yeast? Good question. Why no folic acid in nutritional yeast? Folic acid from the synthetic form that you'll find in supplements or you'll find in nutritional yeast has been associated with breast cancer and I think also prostate cancer, but I'm not sure. There's a couple of different types of cancer that, colorectal cancer, yeah. So that's why if you're doing a supplement too, we want you to do a folic acid free, but we get so much folate from our leafy green vegetables on a plant-based diet that you don't have to worry about getting folate, folic acid. So the other side of swapping is also, I like you to think about nutrifying a recipe. So any recipe you're normally making, you know, I want you to add it to a bed of greens, eat it over a bowl of salad or eat it over a bowl of, cooked greens, just a way to get more of those greens in. It's just a way to nutrify your meal. The other thing is to always do whole grains, of course, and if you can, even, even better yet, try to do sprouted greens once in a while. Just the more whole and natural you can get, the better. Uh, sometimes you could just sprinkle nuts and seeds, you know, just to get those, that one to two ounces in a day or make the dressings out with that. Um, and then sprouting, just in general, it enhances the absorption of, of certain nutrients. A lot of minerals get absorbed better when it's sprouted, so if you can, that's a good way to nutrify your diet. And briefly talking about dining out and traveling, it's become way much easier now to travel and eat plant-based. How many of you have Happy Cow or Yelp, the app, and you just kind of, no matter where you go in the world, you can find plant-based restaurants, you can find markets, and that part's really easy. Um, it's also helpful to look on, online ahead of time to check the menus just to see where you want to go, and you know it's good if you have any of that control. Sometimes it's really good just to go to a store, and we have our clients actually travel with a big Tupperware and a can opener, so you can go anywhere and get some salad and get a can of beans and make a salad anywhere you are. So, like worst case scenario. So it's also good to you know pack food if you know you're not gonna be around something healthy. And you know, and Ray always likes to say it's like you don't need to eat. All, like if you're going across the country, like you know when you're on the plane and like they have to feed you three times from takeoff to um, touchdown. And we really don't, you know, if, if there's nothing healthy on the plane, you'll be fine to get from LA to New York um, and back, and then you just wait until you, the next opportunity to eat a healthy meal. Um, the other thing is to talk to the chef. Sometimes you get someone that's really, I mean, I'm sure you guys have had these experiences where some people are like, oh, I'm so excited, you know, they'll come out, I wanna make you a plant-based meal, I wanna get creative. And then sometimes like, no, we will not serve you, we will not do anything for you, and you're stuck with like lettuce. Or okay, you know, so sometimes that happens, but I think it's getting better and better. Plant pure communities. Plant also Pure Communities. has a restaurant map. They have a restaurant map, good to know, okay. And I heard, it's she said last night that they delivered. International. International, No, 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 good. this is not their prepared meals. But they have a map online? They had like a happy cow kind of thing. Okay, and Plant Pure Communities has a uh, map. So you could look for restaurants from there too. That's good, it's good to like cross-reference. Yeah. I always do both Yelp and Happy Cow, but that's good to know. Uh, and then sometimes like I'll travel with little these. <laughs> Three Russia packets, just in case. <laughs> like if you're on the go, you want to bring your favorite, uh, your favorite condiment. Sometimes we have a we have a hot sauce that Raymond made for me in our room, just in case. On Amazon, Amazon's become my answer for almost everything because it's so easy to get it in a day or two. All right. Oh, so this is just a kind of a collection of our last year since we've been on this boat. Last time we've been to Thailand for two and a quarter months, so three times in 10 months, but I've never been before and we're like madly in love obviously with the amazing food in Thailand. And just to show you, like we were, you know, they were kind of looking at us like plant-based, what do you mean? You know, but they really eat this most amazing plant-based cuisine, they just don't think about it like that because they use meat as a condiment still, like mostly. But they're they're unfortunately westernizing the diet and they're, they're still, we're starting to see the same issues that we're seeing here and around, around the world. But just to show you like all the international delicious plants that we've eaten, just to give you kind of some samples. And we're gonna do, oh, we're gonna do another plant-based retreat next January if you guys wanna join us. The website is bit.ly forward slash plant-based type 2020, right? Something like that. Could well, you say that again, sorry? Yeah, we'll hook you up. It's, Cause there's a capital and it's plant-based Thai 2020, but just email me or I'll send it to you cause I don't have it written down. It's hard to see it when it's not. So just back to the plate. So this is just one example of how to eat whole plant foods, you can get really an incredible array of pretty much everything you need in a diet. I just want to touch on what may be limited and what you need to consider. So we always say that there is no such thing as a perfect diet, right? Every diet has some compromises. And when we look at a plant-based diet, 
really what's missing? What do we really have to worry about? Only a handful of things. So if our current state of health was only about deficiency, then of course we wouldn't see this explosion in world population and survival to reproductive prime, reproducing, raising our offspring to their prime. I mean, humans are amazing biological machines, right? We, are, we do well on a variety, wide variety of diets. So the question doesn't necessarily be, me, have to be what, what can we eat? It's really what should we eat? What's ideal for us? So if you know people that are saying, well, you can't get your B12, you're not gonna get enough protein on a plant-based diet, it's just this in ignorance that really has permeated, unfortunately, even my profession, and a lot of people are just really don't want to kind of think outside the box and realize that if we look at this list of vitamins and minerals that we need to be considering, it's really nothing. It's really five things. It's B12, vitamins D and K, I'm gonna talk a little bit about all of these, and then zinc and iodine, and then the long chain omega-3 fats. So B12 is not a debate, like this is not a debatable. If you guys weren't there last night, like this is something I'm really passionate about because vegans have about 50% incidence of, or prevalence of B12 deficiency. And it's a real serious thing and you won't know it until it's too late because when you test it in your blood, there's like a five to 10 year lag time in your bloodstream. So you're not necessarily gonna see it and you may not see it until it's too late. And we have this, like an actual example with a client this year who was just kind of like, oh, I don't like to swallow pills, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, just take your pills, take your vitamins, take your vitamins. And then a few months later after we, she finished our program, we didn't really talk to her that much, and she called and she's like, oh, my face is numb, and they think I have MS, and she like, they were freaking out worrying about her. I'm like, oh my God, you haven't been taking your vitamins. Go get a B12 shot, and let's pray that this is reversible. Like, I was really worried that that, because usually it's irreversible. She got so lucky because she was able to reverse it, but it's that bad, and usually it's irreversible. So the safest, most effective, cheapest, most reliable way to avoid B12 deficiency is just to pop a supplement. You can get some in Nuch, you can get some in Fortified Foods. It's not reliable, it's not enough, it's not the right dose, you need to be careful of this. <clears throat> and there's a weird logarithmic absorption thing with B12. So if you go to my website, plantbaseddietitian.com, and just search B12, I have a whole post with all the science on it. It's on all of our papers and our books. But just, just to know off the top of your head, but you can always look this up and I'm happy to answer this anytime. You need either, you could do this three ways. You could do, if you're real ambitious, we'll do that again. You could do 50 micrograms twice a day, 150 micrograms once a day, or 2,500 micrograms once a week. One pop, that's a week, it's just an easy once a week. And that's due to all this weird kind of absorption curves. But it's really, really, really important. So please take your B12. And we recommend cyanocobalamin, not the, the methyl. Yes? Can you get too much B12? Can you get too much B12? No. There is not, I don't think there's a single case reported of B12 overdose because it's a water-soluble vitamin. You will literally pee out the extra. But use those numbers for, because then you want the optimal absorption. But you know, I'm not worried about overdose, I'm just worried about you not getting enough. So I'd rather you err on the side of more than less. Can you say those numbers again? Yes. 50 micrograms twice a day, 150 once a day, or 2,500 once a week. Very good. You get an A. Why do we recommend? So the reason we recommend cyanocobalamin form, which is the easiest one to find, by the way, is because all the science and the dosing is all based on that. They always use a cyano. Like, that's where the majority of the research is. That's the main reason. What does that mean? There's different forms of the vitamin. There's just different, literally different chemical versions of it. And you can find both of them. But we used to be like, oh, cyan cyanide and the cyanocobalamin. But it doesn't, like Ray could explain this as a chemist better than I can. I'll let him do that if you're interested. But, um, but there's no reason to be worried about the, cyan the cyanide. It's not poisoning or anything. And it's the way it's metabolized in the body is fine. But the, the one that's mostly out there is a cyanocobalamin. So it's the easiest formula to find anyway. Okay, C Y A N O. Oh, yeah, thanks. C Y A N O C O B A L A M I N. Do you want to explain the cyanide thing, Raymond? We'll do it later. So if you're on, like, if I'm on a methyl B12 shot. Oh, shot's different. Oh, so that's okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, listen to your doctor about shots. And if you're doing the shots, it's going right into your bloodstream, so. Boom. That's, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Yes? Can I ask, what is the dosing for children? Like oh, thank you. I have that on my website. I don't have it in my head because it depends on the age. There's a range. 
Uh, but it's on my website. And if you can't find it, just email me and I'm happy to point you to the numbers. And it's also in our book, but I'm happy to point you to the numbers. It does change based on age. All nutrients do really. And these are all adult doses. And, oh, interesting point I brought up yesterday, I forgot to say today. Everyone over 60, vegan, meat eater, pescatarian, anything, anyone over 60 also needs a B12 supplement. Because intrinsic factor is less potent as we get older and we don't absorb B12 as well. So everyone over 60 and everyone vegan needs to be on a B12 supplement. And don't go for the whole, oh, but I'm taking blue green algae or um, spirulina because those are actually B12 analogs and they go, they bind in those same receptor sites as B12 is supposed to. And then the B12, the active B12 doesn't, can't bind. So that's a problem too. It's what? <coughs> Sublingual? It doesn't matter. They're all really pretty much well absorbed and they're water soluble and they're just easy. So just, and you know what I do? I don't know, that's kind of my weird psychosis again. <laughs> You're gonna learn a lot about my psychosis. But one of them is I don't trust any supplement company 100%. So I'm like, eh, I will rotate brands. <laughs> like every bottle, like I'll buy a different B12. I'm just like, eh, just in case. I don't know. Like, you know, because they've done all like consumer reports has pulled products off the market and tested them randomly. And it's never what they say is in the bottle. It's either different ingredients or additives or less or more. And it just, so I just, I'm a little on the conspiracy side of those things. Yes, sir. B12 and a liquid form and a pill form, which is more Doesn't matter, liquid form, pill form, just take it. I just want you to get the dosing. It's just important, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. They're all really well absorbed. And of course a shot is perfectly absorbed because it's right into your blood. Which I really want to try because everyone says you get this like kind of rush from it, like it feels all this energy. No, no, it's you feel good, yeah. Everyone says you feel really good. I'm dying to try, I'm just curious. Everyone's talking about, what's everyone talking about? Um, no, if not, if everyone was jumping off a building, I wouldn't do that too. Okay, that's what my dad always says. All right, vitamin D is not an issue for vegans. It's kind of, it's not really an issue. It's just we've all of a sudden noticed that around the world, there's this vitamin D deficiency epidemic. I hate saying that word, but it, we're seeing it all over the place. Like there's like this supposed like 65 to 90% of the world population having D deficiency. And the numbers range, it's all kind of crazy, but, but there's a lot of reasons, you know, like we're, we're afraid of the sun. We became afraid of the sun and worried about sun cancer, skin cancer. Also excess fat blocks UVB rays. Um, us using sunscreen blocks UVB rays. So there's a lot of different reasons that people are D deficient, but unlike B12, D is fat soluble. So I don't want you just randomly dosing that. So I have my clients get tested. So the next time, not emergency, but the next time you go for a blood test, ask for your vitamin D. It's very common now. A lot of doctors are just kind of doing it routinely. The other thing is, you know, like the Dr. Furman formula, which we recommend because it just has everything that we're gonna recommend. And um, we just like that formula. Um, he has 2000 IU, which is kind of like a safe dose anyway, if you don't know until you get your numbers. Uh, but if you're low, which a lot of people, even in LA where, you know, we've got this great latitude and sun 380 days a year, we have a lot of D deficiency there too. So. It's just interesting. Also smog has to do with it too. All right, vitamin K is kind of interesting and kind of unique. So we have this vitamin K that we thought, oh, we're great because we are leafy green vegetables. So we're getting plenty of vitamin K, which is true, but it turns out there's more than one form of vitamin K. So we use these for all these different K-dependent proteins, such as those that are involved in um, the clotting of your blood, in bone health, in cardiovascular function. But it turns out that we get the K1 from a diet rich in green vegetables, um, but it's also formed in the gut from bacteria. But there's this whole prioritization thing that happens and it turns out that it may be beneficial to supplement with vitamin K2. And the evidence is pretty compelling because it has a role in vitamin K dependent proteins in the vascular system specifically. So research is suggesting there's like a synergistic effect of supplementing with K2. So something to think about, it's just kind of interesting. And then I just, I'm always want, like calling you camp, yeah. The, um, the vitamin D that I take, it comes with K2. Is, is, Great. Is that for a reason or? or the, the um, they're both fat soluble, so it's probably good for digestion. I, I would guess that's why. It was funny because last night I've, I've known Dr. Campbell for quite some time, and um, I've you know taught his class and everything many years ago. But last night he came to the panel. He said. You know, it was really good. He's like, you're getting a little vitamin heavy over there. <laughs> and he's right. Like, I have kind of evolved my thinking on, on supplements, but I'm really like, I really want vegans to be healthy. Like, that's my goal is to get as many people, like, to, as healthy as we can be and even healthier. So I'm, I keep, I'm open to all this stuff, and that's why it kind of evolves. And 
I'm keeping an open mind because of what we always say was we want to be right. We don't care who's right. We just want to be right and we want to do the best that the science knows right now. So the last two are the minerals, zinc and iodine. So zinc is a trace mineral. We need it for immunity. We need it for neurological function, for growth. You get it from your nuts and seeds and your legumes, which is why those are prioritized in the diet. But because there's like phytates and stuff that, no, they're not bad for you, as some people say, but they may inhibit some of the absorption of zinc. So some vegans tend to fall short on zinc. So it's something to consider as well. And finally, iodine. We need it for thyroid hormones, for metabolism, and for our neurological development. For an adult, we need 150 micrograms. You don't want more and you don't want less. You want to really try to stick to 150. How do you do that? Well, you can get it from sea vegetables, but the reason it was a problem and the reason they iodized salt is because there was all these deficiencies, right? Way back when, if you were getting all those um, goiters, and so they iodized the salt, but what's happened in the last few years? Salt. People aren't using salt, people have hypertension, they're just not using salt, and? Specialty salt. Specialty salt, you've got the Himalayan salt, and the black salt, and the pink salt, the yellow, and yeah, no one's using iodized salt anymore. So it's, we've, times have changed, and we're not getting iodine because it's not in that. So something to consider if you, you know, I like to use those uh, sea vegetable shakers. You know, they add really good flavor. You, can, you could use them and I put them with nooch and you know, you make like a cheese sprinkle out of them. But again, that's not gonna be completely reliable dosing wise. So that goes back to that Dr. Furman's formula. He has a men's formula, he has a women's formula. I don't get kickbacks from it. I just happen to love this formula because it doesn't have folic acid. It has exactly the right amount of B12. It has what you need and not too much of all the, because some of those vitamins are like, we have 5,000% of your vitamin A. I'm like, I don't want 5,000% of my vitamin A. Yes. You said 150 micrograms a day? Yes, an adult needs 150 micrograms a day. Mm -hmm. Men and women, that's one of those rare vitamins, uh, minerals. And what is the dosage for the zinc? The zinc, um, I don't have that number with me. I don't remember. I have it, it's in the book and in the papers and I can look it up for you, but it's, it's not something to worry about. Just make sure you're getting your nuts and seeds and legumes every day but you also may just consider taking it in a supplement. Yeah, because I, I do just open mac and cold. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I was so against a multi for so long. I don't know why. I was like, I came into the hall like, oh, I'm, an, I'm a vegan. I don't need anything, you know? And I was like, okay, I'll take my B12. And I was like, oh, maybe some D because I'm at D is low. And it's like, then I started taking the supplement. I'm like, you know what? Why not? You know, it covers all your bases, especially with my kids. Like, I'm just here to take this. They don't eat perfectly by any stretch of the imagination. It's like you just, it's just, you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's just like an insurance policy. So I'm not hawking supplements. I'm just telling you what I'm seeing and we, what we tell our clients. And then not a vitamin or mineral, but an essential fat. So this is, can get really complicated. So I'll try to keep it really super simple because it's cocktail hour, or past cocktail hour. This point's bedtime at this point. Um, but we need omega-3 fatty acids. There's two kinds of essential amino, uh, essential fats. There's uh, omega-3s and omega-6. Omega-6 is ubiquitous, you can't not get enough, it's everywhere in plants. We tend to get a lot of omega-6, but we don't get a lot of omega-3. Where do we find omega-3? In plants, you get them from chia seeds and flax seeds and hemp seeds, soy foods, walnuts, those are foods that are higher in the ALA, but they're high in the ALA. So then your body digests them and it has absorbed them and it has to elongate into EPA and it has to elongate even further into DHA. Now it turns out we need all three of these different forms for different reasons. Okay, great, we can elongate those, and we do, vegans do. But when you compare the blood of a vegan to the blood of a fish eater specifically, we are far shorter in the longer chain versions. Does that matter? We don't know. We have, I said, decreased risk for cardiovascular disease. We're able to reverse cardiovascular disease. Looks like we show a decreased risk for Alzheimer's. Those are two things that are kind of um, connected to omega-3s. We don't know. So a lot of us have kind of collectively decided, um, I always call Brenda Davis the, the mother of, or what do I call her, the goddess of, of fatty acids, because she was like, she kind of started this and we all kind of followed along. And we're all kind of recommending you take a long chain EP and DHA microalgae formula. So there's a few of them out there now. There's a lot of them actually. So I just take this one called Ovega-3 and um, the dosing isn't perfect. We're actually kind of trying to work on our own version of it because we want to get a, the dosing right. Um, but we just recommend an omega-3 once a day as an option too. And that's it, no more nutrients. Yes, sir. What's a healthy substitute for ice cream? A healthy substitute for ice cream. We're worried about vitamins and minerals and you're worried about ice cream. I like the way you think and it is after hours. So let's talk about that. You have an answer? 
That was, you stole my words right out of my mouth. Nice cream, they call it nice cream. You know, you, you f blend up some banana, some frozen banana, add some cacao powder, add some cayenne powder, or you could just add some blueberries or whatever you like, and my goodness, you can have a party with frozen fruit. And then, great, you're getting your six daily three servings of fruit in a dessert format. And we're gonna have a whole section in our book called sweets, so stay tuned for those recipes. So remember, plan, practice, persist, stay simple. Aristotle insisted that virtues are formed in man by doing the actions, right? All food is habit, pure habit. So famous historian Will Durant reflected on these writings of Aristotle in a quote that is often attributed to Aristotle himself. It says, excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted rightly. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So for us to be successful with a whole food plant-based diet, plan, practice, and persist. It doesn't have to be perfect. And we say that until the new lifestyle is equally convenient, familiar, and enjoyable, you don't really have a choice because one of those is gonna dominate the plate. Success requires that you focus on a simple plan, you practice to make compliance easy and permanent, and most importantly, you persist with increasing variety and all these amazing flavors and colors and textures and experiences. These habits will slowly displace the sometimes deep-seated biases that we've accumulated on what we're supposed to eat, when we're supposed to eat, why we're supposed to eat. And everyone has an opinion on food. You know, it's just amazing that somehow science of nutrition has been overtaken by a confluence of opinions. And there really is a science, and it really is much simpler than we seem to think. So all you need to do is eat more vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. Find the recipes that you love, and you will see results. And the best kept secret in medicine is that when the body is left alone, it often heals itself. So thank you very much for being here.